Good evening, and welcome to the Geological Society's second public lecture of 2019. Uh, I'm Malcolm Brown. I'm a former president of the Society, and just want to hope you've been looking at the um, fire and emergency um, information. There's no fire test planned this evening, so if we have, have one, if the alarm goes off, it's real, and we leave by either by the door here at the front or the door out there at the back, and assemble in the courtyard by the antiquaries. So the Society's designated 2019 the Year of Carbon, and we invite you to join with us in exploring this theme in various conferences, lectures, and educational resources that will be presented through the year. Today, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Turner, who will be telling us about the geological disposal of radioactive waste in the UK. Radioactive waste is generated from a number of different sources, ranging from power stations to weapons facilities to medical waste. And in 2006, the UK government committed to storing radioactive waste in a geological disposal facility which seals waste deep below the ground. And I think this is probably the biggest geological challenge we have in this country going forward. I really do. In December 2018, the UK government launched the process to find an appropriate site for a geological disposal facility. Jonathan will tell us about how radioactive waste management will work with communities across England to identify potential locations for the facility and the geological considerations that will underpin the selection of the site. Jonathan is the Chief Geologist at Radioactive Waste Management and the Chartered Geologist. He has extensive experience in project delivery in the oil and gas sector and subsurface engineering. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you, Malcolm. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, another wonderful turnout. This is the second time I've, I've done this today. I've never given a lecture where there's both a matinee and an evening performance, and uh, it's absolutely great. So, yes, thank you for coming out to, uh, to hear about uh, a project that's it's both exciting for the UK and it's really important uh, for the UK. And a lot of the focus of my talk today is going to be on giving you a flavour for some of the technical challenges involved in deep geological disposal of Britain's uh, higher activity radioactive waste legacy. But my first slide, you'll see, shows uh, a lot of people. These happen to be some of my colleagues from various different um, uh, skill sets and different teams within RWM, but the focus here being on people. And actually, the main message, despite the fact that a lot of the emphasis of the talk is on the, the technical challenge, the main message uh, that I'd like you to take away in terms of how RWM and the government and UK PLC, if you like, will deliver uh, deep geological disposal of radioactive waste is that it's dependent on people. And two broad categories of, of people that I'm thinking of there. There's us, the, the taxpayers, who will fund uh, this project, and by funding it, we thereby have to agree that it's a good idea and it's the right thing to do. And then there's, secondly, there's the communities who will recognise the, the long-term benefit, the long-term investment in infrastructure uh, and jobs that's entailed in hosting uh, deep geological disposal of radioactive waste and will engage with RWM, that's my company, in a discussion with us. So the point I make is that despite all the technical challenges, engineering, geology, material science, chemistry, physics, so forth, this is what's called a public consent-led process. So we don't have a list of ideal sites that we'd really like to evaluate. Which sites we evaluate and where we eventually site this facility will be entirely dependent on which communities come forward. Okay. So the, the, the shots here, which I shall, or the, the photos which I shall return to, are stills taken uh, from videos that we produced. It's one of, a, one of a number, a suite really, of communication tools that RWN has worked very, very hard to produce that allow us to communicate some of the technical concepts uh, involved in radioactive waste disposal. By the way, I plan to talk for hopefully no more than 45 minutes, so lots of time for, for questions at the end. 
So if I start, I'm going to try and keep this talk as acronym-free as I can, with one exception being GDF. So GDF is, is a geological disposal. So it's, a, it, it's the project that this talk is about. It's about deep geological disposal uh, of Britain's um, uh, higher activity radioactive waste. And the first point I'd make, I think it's a really important one, and it's one which people often, you know, they're surprised to see me emphasizing so strongly. So RWM is wholly owned by the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, so it's, a, it's owned essentially, owned and funded by the government. And therefore, it's tempting to think of RWM's mission, delivery of a GDF, as being part of the nuclear industry. And I would argue, actually, we're part of the environment industry. As Malcolm said in his introduction, this is one of the uh, largest ever environmental projects that Britain uh, has undertaken and arguably one of the most important. So three key ingredients that we need to go ahead with this project. Uh, a willing community, I've emphasized that already. A suitable site, and by a suitable site, I mean one in which we can design a facility that can be operated safely during the 100 or so years during which we'll be operating it. But the, a second part of that term, a suitable site, is a site in which we can demonstrate the long-term safety uh, of, of uh, keeping that nuclear material isolated from uh, the surface where it could harm people and the environment. And then the third key ingredient is waste needs to be packaged in the right way. And that's a process which is ongoing at the moment. So we, RWM, work closely with the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, and particularly Sellafield Limited, in order to make sure it's certain that the waste that they're packaging is appropriate for us to dispose of in the facility that we uh, eventually design. The two points at the bottom there really uh, make an important point. It's highly engineered, and the point that the word that I'm avoiding in there is it's not a dump. Now, I can see why the media often use this term dump, because geological disposal facility, I think, is... 12 syllables, and dump is one syllable. But we all know that dump, it sort of conjures up the wrong image. So we need to come up with something fewer than 12 syllables, but which doesn't conjure up that image. And then lastly, a point which the media often get wrong, not, I think, through mischievousness, but actually through genuine lack of understanding, that this project is about disposal. It's about permanent disposal and not storage. It's about finding a site developing a highly engineered facility and disposing of this material uh, permanently. So the schematic that you see here, and I emphasize it is a schematic, it's a cartoon really, we uh, produce just to give people a feel for what a geological disposal facility might look like. It's highly unscaled, it's a rather weird sort of perspective view. A more scaled cross-section is this one here, and what this tells you is that the facility will be between 200 and 1,000 metres depth. So just to give you a feel for how, oh, for how deep that is, uh, the deepest point of the London Underground, about 65 metres. So if we return to this cartoon here, the surface footprint will be between about one and two square kilometres, the subsurface footprint up to uh, about 20 square kilometres. So you see what I mean about the weird perspective. Just to give you a feel for that point I made earlier, that the site and the design that we eventually settle on will be entirely dependent on the geology beneath the feet of the community that comes forward. We don't have a list of favoured sites. Just to give you a feel for what I mean by that. So what this shows here is that the surface facilities are vertically above the subsurface tunnels and vaults in which the material is disposed. There are some shafts here that go vertically downward. There's a, what's called a drift, a sort of ramp that enables you to get heavy plant from the surface to the underground. Just to give you a feel for how much it could vary, the underground tunnels and vaults, they could be offshore. They could be in the 20 kilometer zone between the coast and the offshore environment. We call it the nearshore environment. It might be on one level, as is shown here, it might be multi-story. The surface facilities might be laterally offset from the subsurface facilities. For example, we might be prevented from putting the surface facilities in an area of outstanding natural beauty. Not a problem, you just offset them. If you go to Bulby Mine, for example, the potash mine in the northeast of England, 
the subsurface mine is off offset from the surface facilities by about 13 kilometers. So there's a huge range of different options that we have according to which communities come forward. So people are always interested to know the nature of the inventory. I've said it there, about 750,000 cubic meters of packaged waste. What does that equate to? A cube about the height of the Queen Elizabeth Tower or Big Ben, uh, or I believe about two <coughs> footballs per person for everyone that lives in the UK. And what I'm going to do now is just show the different components of the waste inventory that was sort of build up with a, with a coloured bar at the bottom. So firstly, a relatively small contribution to that total inventory from enrichment and fuel fabrication, so the manufacture of fuel and some other nuclear materials. Defence, a tiny component, by far the bulk in terms of volume of that 750,000 cubic metre inventory is accounted for by uh, nuclear power stations. And it says, and reprocessing there. So you may know that the Thorpe <coughs> reprocessing plant on the Sellafield site closed toward the end of autumn last year. So really, this is now just uh, nuclear power stations. And then lastly, the new nuclear bill programme. So Britain currently plans for about 16 gigawatts of new nuclear bill. That's been in the news a lot in the last six months, particularly the problems around Wilver and Oldbury and Moorside in Cumbria. But nonetheless, our planning and our total inventory plans for the spent fuel and other materials that will come from that 16 gigawatts of uh, new nuclear build. Ah, and lastly, medical. And it is on there, but it's volumetrically so minute that you probably barely notice the little green bar at the end there. So essential for society, but volumetrically a tiny component of the total inventory. So a cartoon here, it's from uh, Neil Chapman, who's a, a consultant and a, a nuclear inspector. Uh, and what it shows, and what I really like about this diagram is the way in which you can use it to show the, the key functions of a geological disposal facility, whether it's in the UK or whether it's overseas. And these are, these are the three bywords by which we design the facility. It has to be capable of firstly containing radionuclides, preventing their migration to the surface <coughs> and the shallow subsurface where they could contaminate the biosphere and harm people and the environment. Secondly, I mentioned that the facility will be between 200 and 1,000 metres. It certainly won't be shallower than 200 metres. It's <coughs> unlikely to need to go deeper than 1,000 metres. When you look at what other countries are doing in terms of their GDS, they're mostly around 500 600 metres depth, and the reason for that depth is because of the need to isolate the material from two processes, two factors, if you like. One is human intrusion, what we sometimes call inadvertent human intrusion, in other words, the idea that future generations <clears throat> and future civilizations could mine into the GDF. And the second process that you're isolating the GDF from is surface processes. As I'll show in a minute, over the up to million year time scale that we will need to demonstrate to regulators that this facility will be safe, uh, a certainty for the UK and for Northern Europe is that there will be significant climate change, that there will be ice ages and glaciations and permafrost. So we need to uh, excavate and construct the facility sufficiently deep such that it's isolated from surface processes, particularly uh, climate change. And then the third byword, as it says there, is, is passive safety. This is about permanent disposal, not storage, and it's about a highly engineered facility in which once we've filled it and backfilled it and decommissioned it and remediated the landscape above ground, we essentially walk away and leave it. So the schematic shows a few of the kinds of features that we need to take account of. Here's the GDF glowing red in the deep subsurface there. Here's a, a fault or fracture zone a potential pathway, fast pathway for radionuclides to get from depth to the surface and the shallow subsurface, either in groundwater or in gas. The point here being very important, which I shall return to several times during this talk, what we're looking for is geology in which you have very old, stable groundwater systems that are isolated 
from shallow groundwater systems, and particularly isolated from some of the principal aquifers uh, that are important for society. So let's just look in a little more detail at an example of how we'll factor in some of the surface processes. So I spoke about climate change, and drastic climate change is a certainty for the UK when you're working to a timescale of hundreds of thousands of years, indeed up to a million years. And the map that you see here was produced uh, for RWM uh, by the British Geological Survey, with whom we work very closely. And the colours, if you can't see the key there, the colours are showing predicted thickness of permafrost, or frozen ground, uh, during uh, a glacial event. And the blue colour is showing in excess of 400 metres thickness of frozen ground. Now, there are places in the world at the moment, northern Canada, for example, where permafrost attains hundreds of metres thicknesses. So there's nothing particularly um, revolutionary about that. But what's important in terms of the impact that that can have on a GDF is particularly the impact that permafrost has on disturbing the deep groundwater system, so the way in which it interferes with the hydrogeology. So this is just an example of how we need to model the long-term post-closure history uh, or development, evolution of the UK in order to be able to demonstrate to regulators that we've cited it in a, in, in a geology and at a depth in which it will be safe over that very long time period. The diagram here, by the way, is just going into a little bit of detail about the main processes and factors by which this map is put together. There are three controls on thickness of that permafrost. One, perhaps the most obvious one, is climatic forcing. In other words, climatic change, the development of ice ages and cold periods. The second is the thermal properties of the geology. And the third is the ability of the geology to distribute the heat and transport the heat away, mainly by fluids flowing through fractures. So an example of that would be the Dartmoor granites down in the southwest here. You see the permafrost is modelled to be much less thick over the Dartmoor granites because they're so highly fractured, those granites are capable of advecting the heat away and therefore thinner permafrost. So Sweden's a good example of a country uh, that's needing to factor these sorts of long-term climate change uh, considerations into their programme for developing uh, a GDF. Sweden are a long way ahead of the UK in that they've chosen their site uh, for a GDF and they're now in the process of becoming what's called a, a site licence company, basically getting their licence from the government to be able to commence the process of constructing their facility and uh, burying radioactive material. So part of their solution to the certainty that the uh, Scandinavian region will be covered in ice, so only 20,000 years ago, the northern part of Scandinavia would have had ice sheets up to a kilometre thick. Part of their solution to dealing with that is to encase their uh, mainly spent fuel nuclear waste in these five centimetre thick copper canisters. They're about five metres long. Those canisters themselves are emplaced in a ring, a sort of donut of swelling clay, the idea being that when the GDF fills up with water, when it resaturates, that clay will swell and lock in the copper canister such that fluids can't get to the copper canister. There's a really neat method they use for sealing the lid onto the top of the canister. It's called friction stir welding. It's actually a UK-developed piece of technology. So that's their solution to dealing with this sort of long-term impact that, in this case, climate change can have on the deep groundwater system. There's just one other part of this slide that I just want to uh, digress on for a few moments. So what we see here are three very happy-looking gentlemen. The man on the right is Klaus Tegerstrom, who was president of SKB, which is our RWM's counterpart in Sweden. And then the two other gentlemen are the mayors of, firstly, Forskash... Uh, Forschmark up here and Oskarsham down here. And the communities of Oskarsham and Forschmark essentially competed with one another to host the geological disposal facility. And SKB decided in the end it would go to Forschmark. So he's very happy. Why is he smiling equally? 
while they decided that a lot of the supporting uh, industrial facilities, for example, the packaging factory and the packaging plant, would be sited at Oskarshamn. So just a really nice example of the mayors of communities recognising the long-term impact on jobs and investment that hosting a GDF can have. So what the map shows here is uh, a part of what's called national geological screening. And it may have escaped your notice that just sort of slipped out very low profile before Christmas, uh, 19th December to be precise. Uh, the English government published uh, what's called its working with communities policy. And then the same policy or very similar policy was published by the Welsh government uh, about three weeks ago. And what that means is that we are essentially the government uh, has now fired the starting gun on the site selection process. So many of my colleagues who have been involved in this industry for some of them for as much as 20 years have really been waiting for this moment. We are now in a live site selection process where we are uh, talking uh, to real communities and uh, explaining to them what we're going to do and the benefits of hosting this facility. So part of that site selection process has been to produce the National Geological Screening. And what it does, it divides England, Wales, Northern Ireland into 13 regions. Each of those regions are further subdivided into sub-regions. And National Geological Screening, it's online, it's available at the website whose address I've given at the top there in blue. It describes how geology contributes to the safety uh, of a GDF. So it's a tiered document. It starts off with some very high-level statements, and then as you go further and further into the document in more and more geological detail according to uh, uh, how much information you want to learn. We have worked really hard to develop a, a suite of products that enable us to communicate some of the technical contents, uh, concepts, some of the detailed nomenclature and, and uh, uh, technical language that's used within the National Geological Screening. So the stills of some of my colleagues that I showed in the slide at the start of this talk, those are taken from videos that we produce that are embedded within the National Geological Screening. This fence diagram of cross sections here that was produced by the British Geological Survey, that's also available to be linked to directly from the National Geological Screening. And what this shows is our understanding of the subsurface. So each of these fences here is a cross section extending to several kilometers depth. But equally, it shows where there are big gaps in our understanding of the subsurface. So I think it gives people a feel, at least, for what we know about the subsurface, and just as important, what we don't know. So what I'm going to do now is just go through the five different subheadings under which the geology is described within this National Geological Screening, just to give a, a flavor of how different components of the geology contribute to the safety of a GDF. The map there on the left just makes the point as if it needs making, I mean, England, Britain, sure, that's true, but England in particular, very densely populated and uh, a highly manicured landscape. You know, there's barely anywhere you can go uh, in the UK, but particularly England, where the land isn't intensively used. So it's a real challenge, a very different challenge, for example, to developing a facility like this in less populated parts of countries like the United States, for example. <coughs> So like I say, five subheadings under which the geology is described in the National Geological Screening. And the first is rock type. So the map here, which is a British Geological Survey map of the surface geology of the UK, it just really emphasises that for our little postage stamp size piece of crust, we've got an extraordinarily diverse uh, range of, of different geologies and a, a rich geological heritage. And for our purposes, we divide that uh, huge range of different rock types into three broad categories of rock type that, are, uh, that could host a geological disposal facility. So the first of those at the top we call high-strength rocks. So, for example, granites and slates would be examples of high-strength rocks. The important things about high-strength rocks for our purposes is that fluids move through them uh, via fractures and cracks. Next down, low-strength sedimentary rocks, basically clay. This is uh, Jurassic, mainly Jurassic, Cretaceous, and tertiary or Cenozoic clays. So 
very, very low permeability, very sort of almost ceramic fine grain size. The way in which fluids move very slowly through those sort of clay-type rocks is by a process known as diffusion. And then thirdly, given a category all of its own, mainly because it doesn't fit into either of the other two, is salt. The important, or salt's got several really useful properties for constructing a GDF in. One is that it's, as I've said there, it's impermeable. Fluids don't flow, don't, don't move through salt. They don't even move through salt by diffusion. The other point about salt is that it's extremely dry. If you've ever been down a salt mine or into a salt cave, there are some tourist salt caves around, you'll know what I mean. It's an incredibly uh, dry environment. And there's a third property of salt, the fact that it moves over relatively short time periods that I'll return to a little bit later. So rock type is the first sort of geological um, uh, category under which uh, the geology is described in the National Geological Screening. Second is structure. And by structure, I mean mainly uh, folds and buckles in the rock layers. I mean fractures and cracks, and I mean big fault lines. So the map here on the bottom, wonderful surface geological map of the Mendips region uh, just south of Bristol, just east of the M5 motorway. In terms of structure, just about everything is going on here. So these blue bands, these are carboniferous limestone. You can see that these big curves in here are showing that the carboniferous limestone has been quite dramatically folded. There are also some big fault lines that run, for example, along here, cutting right through Cheddar Gorge that cuts down through here. That limestone is intensively fractured. If you've ever been caving, as I used to do when I was at Bristol University, just to the north of here, those caves are basically where groundwater has exploited the fractures and the cracks. So in terms of structure, everything is going on here. It's quite a complex region structurally. I just make the point that remember that the subsurface footprint for a GDF is 20 square kilometers, about four by five or three by six something like that. So on this kind of large scale, we might have all sorts of structural complexity. It doesn't mean that we can't evaluate a part of that area and find something which might be suitable. I just make the plug for William Smith at the top there. Uh, I guess most people here have been to the Geological Society before. If you haven't, William Smith 200 years ago recognized the importance of structure when he was putting together what was the first national geological map in the world beautiful cross-section there showing the, the dipping strata. I must admit, I can't remember exactly where it's from, but you can see his original map, or one of his original hand watercolored maps outside hanging just above the stairs. So we've done rock type, we've done structure. Thirdly, natural processes. So for people who've done a geology degree, natural processes would often be called natural hazards. For Britain, the main natural processes that we're interested in are earthquakes and as I've spoken about already, a significant climate change, glaciations, ice ages, permafrost. Now, the map on the right there shows the surface positions or the epicenters of earthquakes uh, in Britain uh, over the last 50 years. It's again, it's a map from the British Geological Survey. Britain is relatively seismically inactive. There are relatively few earthquakes in Britain. That doesn't mean to say there are none as you see here. I live in Birmingham. We've experienced a real earthquake in Birmingham uh, about 15 years ago. Not coal mine collapse, but real uh, tectonically driven earthquake. So they're inactive, they're relatively low frequency, doesn't mean to say there are none. And when we start focusing in on individual sites, we'll need to look at the incidence of earthquakes that affect those individual sites. The second main aspect of natural processes, which I have said something about already, so I won't dwell on it for too long, is glaciation and climate change and the fact that the northern part of Britain could be affected by continental ice caps. So the map here, it's a perspective view on the English Midlands and extending over to the left into the uh, Welsh borderlands. It's highly vertically exaggerated and the colours are just simply showing height above sea level. So we can see the Severn Valley picked out very clearly. Clee Hill, Breeden Hill, just to the north of Cheltenham, just to the east of the M5 motorway. The Cotswold Scarp, looking like the Himalaya here. I just make the point that 
OK, we've got some of the oldest rocks in the world in the northern half of Britain. But actually, if you stand, as this photo shows, uh, above the Goring Gap, where the River Thames cuts through the chalk, cuts through the Chiltern Hills, very close to RWM's office at Harwell, you're looking out onto a relatively young, less than half million year old landscape. And, you know, you see that 450,000 year number there, and you think to yourself, that's within the post-closure timescale that we need to be able to demonstrate to regulators the safety of a GDF. So we're dealing with processes that occur over a geological timescale, not just uh, an historical timescale. So two subsections of this national geological screening left. Ever so important, number four is groundwater, and it really says it in the text on the left there. We will need to cite the GDF where we can demonstrate groundwater moves very slowly and crucially where deep groundwater systems are isolated from shallow groundwater systems. The map here shows some of the principal aquifers and you know, subterranean water, uh, geological groundwater is extremely important for the UK. We've got two particularly important aquifers uh, in the UK. We've got the chalk, which is picked out in this lime green color, which is an extremely important source uh, of water for uh, domestic water for London. We've got the uh, Triassic Sherwood Sandstone Aquifer. I think it's in that blue color there, which is, for example, uh, very important for the region where I live. About half of Birmingham's um, domestic water supply comes from the Triassic groundwater. Hence the point that we need to make certain that the facility is at least 200 metres depth, so there's no interference between aquifers and the GDF. One of the really powerful ways in which we will be able to demonstrate that we can, uh, that, that deep groundwater is isolated from shallow groundwater is to use stable isotopes to uh, measure the residence interval, the time, during which inter uh, the time period during which groundwater has been static in the subsurface. And this example from a published paper based on uh, the East Midlands area of central England shows that at only 400 metres depth uh, in the uh, Triassic Sherwood sandstone aquifer, you've got groundwater which has sat there for something like 100,000 years. That's a really powerful piece of evidence for demonstrating that deep groundwater systems are not moving uh, and you know, won't be able to transport radionuclides up to the surface. And then lastly, remember I'm on this theme of national geological screening and the way that we describe how the geology contributes to the safety of a GDF. Resources. We want to avoid areas that have been intensively exploited for resources. You know, Britain is the nucleus of the Industrial Revolution, so we've been mining coal, for example, and iron ore for uh, more than 200 years. A lot of those mines and shafts and underground workings aren't particularly well surveyed, they're not particularly well mapped, we don't know where they are. Where we do know where they are, and I don't just mean mines and shafts and drifts, but also boreholes, they disturb the subsurface groundwater system. So we will avoid areas that have been intensively exploited for resources intensively drilled, uh, mined for coal, and also we need to be uh, mindful of areas which have been licensed for oil and gas exploration. So this example in the southeast part of England. Okay, so that's the headings under which the National Geological Screening describes the how geology contributes to safety. So our planning assumptions uh, plan for the fact that five years from now we'll have gone from many communities down to two communities and at that point we get to that situation like I showed for the, the three happy gentlemen in Sweden. At that point essentially RWM turns into a sort of mini oil and gas company in that it really needs to develop detailed descriptions of those two sites. And those detailed descriptions we often call a site descriptive model. It'll be a sort of 3D block model of the underground geology down to the level of the GDF, beneath the level of the GDF, the geology above the GDF, and the topography and surface facilities. As it says there on the left, these will be the most detailed descriptions of the underground geology that have ever been undertaken uh, for the UK. What are the main data sources that feed into them? 
Well, unsurprisingly, boreholes. And the picture that you see here is of some of the boreholes that were drilled during the 1990s as part of Nirex's campaign to develop a facility uh, just south of Sellafield. You can see Sellafield and Calder Hall steaming away in the background there. So what contributes to this site descriptive model? Firstly, boreholes. Secondly, geophysics, and in particular, seismic surveying. So the picture here shows some uh, vibrosized trucks that are used to acquire onshore uh, seismic data to give you a, an, an image, a picture of the underground geology ever so important in the oil and gas industry, and a lot of the geophysics technology that we use will be pretty much directly imported from uh, the way that the oil and gas industry has used it. And then last but not least, don't forget that even where we get to the point where we've selected a site, we've recommended our preferred site to government, they've given us the go-ahead to begin constructing and excavating, we've got the support of the local community, we will continue with all the underground excavation to acquire data during the construction phase that will feed into that site descriptive model. We'll continue to test the predictions from this model against what we actually observe when we actually go underground. So that's how we put the model together. Who will use the model? What use will we make of it? And three main users for that model. There's the engineering team that will actually design the tunnels and vaults and drifts and shafts that make up the geological disposal facility. There's what's called the post-closure safety team. This is the uh, collection of environmental scientists and computer modelers and many other sorts of specialists that understand, that try to model the, uh, the, the future evolution of the environment around the GDF on that 100,000 year to million year time scale. So the example I talked about earlier was for, was for permafrost. And then lastly, and something which I think we, we, we do well not to forget, and that is that this model will be a really powerful tool for us to communicate with our many stakeholders, the communities that we're working with, the general public, government, and of course, crucially, uh, the regulators. Okay, so I've shown an example. One of the questions that we often get, get is, are other countries doing this? Yes, they are, and I can understand where the question comes from. I think it's always very reassuring to know, whilst we're behind the curve compared to almost every other country that's developing its own geological disposal facility, it's very reassuring for people to know, yes, other countries have opted for deep geological disposal as their preferred solution for disposing of radioactive waste, and of course, we're able to benefit from collaborating with France, with Sweden, with Finland, with the United States, with Germany, and so forth, to learn what's worked for them and what hasn't. So a couple of examples now. The first from France, so their delivery body, the company that's actually uh, tasked with delivering their geological disposal facility is called Andra. The site they've chosen is about 180 kilometers southeast of Paris at Bure, and they are constructing their facility at about 500 meters depth in a middle Jurassic clay. So it's a super fine-grained clay. It's about 100 meters thick. So the pictures that you can see there here, on the left, a tunnel boring machine that they've used to, to bore their tunnels. If you like big toys, then this is certainly uh, the industry for you. Here we are in one of those tunnels. It's lined with these sort of uh, curved concrete um, uh, panels that go on the edge of the tunnel. And then interestingly here on the right, this is above ground. This is a full-scale mock-up of one of the tunnels that's drilled into the side of the tunnel here, stainless steel canister containing the nuclear material, and then this remote control sort of push me, pull me vehicle that pushes the canister down the tunnel. So it lines up about 20 canisters, once again, uh, one against another, and slides them down an individual tunner, tunnel. So that's how France are, uh, that's the solution that uh, France have come up with. And then thirdly, and you'll notice I'm covering all the main host rock types here, so we've looked at Sweden, and they're developing their facility in high-strength rock, granite, basically. We've looked at France, who are developing their facility in that low-strength sedimentary rock or clay. And thirdly, the United States, the only operating uh, geological disposal facility in the world at present. They've been disposing of their 
uh, intermediate level transuranic waste for uh, 20 years now, and they are placing their material in a Permian salt. So about a 260 million year old bed of salt in the southern part of New Mexico. It's a desert environment. The um, competition for land use there is, is relatively low. It's actually within what's called the Permian Basin, which are presently undergoing a sort of gold rush in terms of uh, a really productive oil shale that has been discovered there, but it's a, a very sparsely populated region. Now, you remember I was say saying earlier that the advantages of salt is it has very low permeability, it doesn't transmit fluids, uh, and it's also a very dry environment. The third characteristic of salt is that over relatively short geological time scales, tens or hundreds, yeah, historical time scales really, tens or hundreds of years, salt creeps. It flows like a, a, a plastic material. And so here's a, a picture of one of the vaults in which the nuclear material is stacked, and they won't entomb this in any sort of concrete backfill. What they'll do is they'll put a seal in the end of the vault and they'll just allow nature to take its place. And the ceiling will begin to flow down onto the nuclear material. The edges of the vault will come in. And after a few hundred years, this will be encased uh, in this Permian salt. Even when you go down the facility and look around the, the, the walls and the roof, this is a picture of the roof. And you can see that it's really quite a, quite a bowed in quite a pronounced way. It's all very well understood. There's nothing catastrophic about it. It's not cracking or fracturing. It's just slowly flowing and creeping, and that's characteristic of salt. So to finish, I'm just going to really return to nature, because one of the really powerful tools we have found for communicating the, the, uh, the, the technical challenge of this project is to look at natural analogues, and we've got a whole suite of, of natural analogues, from ancient glasses to uh, preservation of organic material that we use to show the long-term integrity of some of the materials that we'll use uh, in a geological disposal facility. And the two examples I've picked here, on the right there is, uh, as it says, a 400-year-old cannon barrel. Now, near to the photographer, near to the camera, you can see that it's really quite corroded. You can see that sort of green copper oxide sheen on it, and that's because that end was sticking out into the water, into oxygenated water. The other end of the cannon barrel, which I hope you can see, is a lot better preserved, looks a, more, a lot more pristine, was sticking into an anoxic sort of stinking mud. So the lack of oxygen has meant much slower corrosion and long-term, much better preservation uh, of this mainly uh, copper-based uh, cannon barrel. The example on the left there, the sort of cartoon on the far left, and then the aerial photo, is as it says there, it's from the Cigar Lake uranium mine, so the world's largest high-grade, so 20% grade uranium mine in Saskatchewan. And it's really quite a nice example of what we call a, a natural GDF. So the uranium ore itself is encased in uh, 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 an anoxic clay. So again, coming back to the anoxic conditions that have preserved the cannon barrel here. So an organic rich, very low oxygen clay. It's as it says there, it's about 1.3 1, 1 billion, year billion years old, that uranium deposit, and there's no trace of radionuclides at the surface. The uranium has remained encased in the clay over a billion year period plus. It's just a nice example of, like I say, what we call a natural GDF. So at that, I'm going to finish, and I just urge you to keep in touch with us. As I said toward the start of this talk, we're now in a, a real site selection process, which is incredibly exciting, not just for RWM, but I hope for the UK. And, you know, we're in listening mode. The success of this project will depend entirely on uh, working with the general public and particularly working with communities who are interested in hosting this facility. So thank you very much. Excellent. Jonathan, thank you very much. That's very, very good.
questions from the floor? Come on, let's stand there. Can you hold just the microphone, please, and we'll, we'll, we'll record this. And, sorry, you need to... Thanks very much for that talk. It was really, really interesting and really well laid out for a piece of sort of critical UK infrastructure. Um, having worked in the UK shale gas for a while and experienced a hor horrific planning process and tr trying to get a social licence to operate, I wondered how confident are you that you can find uh, the particular sites which the communities are willing to give up and uh, what other mechanisms do you uh, envisage that the UK government could do in order to um, facilitate this development? The last part of that question was very, uh, very ominous. So let me de de deal with that in a minute. I like your use of the term social licence to operate. I mean, that's something that, that, that we've used in oil and gas, and I directly translate to our present mission. I think you're absolutely right to use that term. Um, so the main part of your question was about, you know, how are we going to persuade communities that this is a good idea and, you know, uh, that, 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 they should, that they should work with us over this 100-year-plus period. Well, I mean, I think there's no altruism on that sort of community level. I think it will depend on them recognising two things. First is the potential for long-term investment in their community, long-term jobs, the picture of the smiling mayors in Sweden. No one has imposed that facility on them. They, they were really up for it, and in the end, they were competing for it to get it, and they were disappointed when the, when the one of them didn't get it. So communities understanding that it's a really long-term investment uh, for their local area. And secondly, uh, for us to communicate not just to communities, but to the public in general, that we are going to do it safely. You know, the number one question on everyone's mind is, how are you going to do it safely? And, you know, I made the point that it's a highly engineered facility. I made the, you know, I've elaborated quite a lot on how we are going to, you know, really understand the subsurface geology and how that subsurface geology works together with the engineered barrier system. That's the packaging and the canisters and the swelling clay. And they work together to seal this material in and prevent it from migrating to the shallow subsurface over that 100,000-year period. So it's about long-term investment, and it's about safety. The last part of your question, I think, was addressing what happens if no one came forward. I know you didn't put it that way, but that's sort of what I heard. There is, if you read the 2014 white paper, there is a single line in there, and I can't remember it verbatim, and it doesn't talk about anything like compulsory purchase, which would set hairs running, but it does reserve the right to... Plan B, and you know quite what Plan B is, uh, you know is not clear, and the government isn't clear because all the emphasis at the moment, as I hope I make clear, is on engaging with communities. You know, I mean, I've worked for a number of companies, and more often than not, their company values are pretty forgettable. But for our, for our WM, we need to live and breathe our company values. You know, we need to be safe, we need to be professional, we need to engage, and we need to learn. So it's a Bit of a long answer, but thank you. That's good. Uh, one over there, please. Hello. Uh, that was very interesting. I'm wondering, do you run your plans via any moral ethical committees before you get to this stage? Because it seems to me very strange that you're trying to balance people's short-term needs, and even though you're talking about long-term long -term investment, that's not long in the in the um, terms that you're talking about for the disposal facilities. So how can you balance um, individual communities' relatively short-term needs and um, desire for investment with um, a long-term storage, sorry, disposal facility that could affect the whole of, their, the, whole of the um, environment? Um. Well, I heard the word ethics there, and you know, just to just to emphasise that it's it's not going to be, notwithstanding my answer to the gentleman's question at the end there. I mean, it's the plan is not to impose this facility on anyone. It, it, this this pro this project is not going to work if we don't uh, remain engaged with communities over multiple generations. There is a small amount of community investment, starting with a million pounds per community per year, ramping up to two and a half million pounds per community per year. But that's hardly 
uh, on parity with the level of investment that we will be making over that sort of 100 year plus period. The reason for that million ramping up to two and a half million year investment is because we recognize that the people who are engaging with us now in the 2010s, nearly 2020s, aren't actually the generation that will benefit from that long-term investment. So we felt we needed to make some money available now, recognizing that the long-term investment will be felt by future generations. But, I mean, that, that, for me, there isn't an ethics dimension to it because we're not imposing anything on anyone. It just seems wrong that this is an industry that's been going for a long while and it develops and the experts um, gain in their expertise and knowledge and the methods that they use to try and dispose of the waste that wasn't necessarily foreseen in its entire horror at the start of the um, nuclear industry. And you're Okay, so one, you're one quick answer. One, one quick answer for you, which, which hopefully can go some way towards uh, answering your question, and that is that... What would you rather? I mean, presently, this material is stored above ground at about 30 different sites. So about through two-thirds of it is at Sellafield, about 10% is at Dune Ray, north of Scotland. The rest of it is about 25 sites uh, distributed around the UK, mainly reactors and decommissioned reactors. Now, that material will remain there in perpetuity with all the safety and safeguarding implications that above-ground storage entails unless we do something with it. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that the chances of an accident are zero, we will need to demonstrate to regulators that the chances of contaminating the environment to a certain level of dose is something like 10 to the minus 6, i.e. 1 in a million. And I think that's a much better solution than leaving it above ground where it's open to all sorts of things that we can all imagine in the room here. The world is a rapidly changing place and I'd rather put it somewhere safe than leave it above ground. Okay. Yeah. Got a question down. I wonder if they all said the same thing. Vale. vale. Oh, uh, mining, Vale in Brazil. Yeah. I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm just going along with the uh, lady over there who made the point, because my point is, I realise that what happens uh, above the surface of the Earth cannot necessarily be compared to what happens below it. Um, there are, after all, I think, uh, there's an aspect of out of sight, out of mind. Um, there are approximately 1,350 sites around the world which have got uh, tailings in mining sites. Um, and there has been, until now, no authority controlling the safety of these uh, That's true, but that's, that's mining I and know, vale. I know. And but that's, uh, you know, tailings, dams. Pardon? We have Alabang. I know, I know. No, we can do it well above ground. We didn't do it well above ground. Well, there's too many examples of it not being done well above ground, to my mind. I let's have, let's it's, just, it's just an issue. It's, it's, it's a huge issue, which I don't actually uh, wish upon our generation or generations to come. But I go back to my answer to the uh, lady in Mauve there. You know, what would you rather, that we develop this highly engineered Obviously, facility... I work in the most highly regulated industry probably that there is in the UK, and we have a solution, and we're following the footsteps of about six other countries who are doing the same thing. Would you rather go down that path or leave it above ground in perpetuity? I keep going back to the in perpetuity thing. You know, this material remains highly active for hundreds of thousands of years. Some of the half-lives, of course, are millions of years. Yes, I realise. Yeah. But you said it's getting rid of it altogether. You made the point with regard to the salt, which comes in and you crush it. Mm -hmm. And it disappeared. No, it doesn't disappear. It's okay. entombed. It's entombed. Okay. So it doesn't disappear. No, okay. So it is actually waste <coughs> containment rather than disposal. No, it's disposal because we're <coughs> putting it there forever. Well, yeah, but what does Mother Nature choose to do? I come from Lincolnshire near Market Racing. You made the point of earthquakes. Oh, I yeah. sat in London and felt the shudder of that earthquake. My mother, when she was alive, she died four years ago, said, Jeff, I've just had a tremendous experience. Mm. I spoke to a colleague of yours who was lecturing here. He said sometimes when earthquakes happen, there are electrostatic, uh, I don't know what the technical scientific term, things happen. And she 
she actually saw these things. She was 10 miles from the site of the drill. Okay. So That's we I don't know when those earthquakes are going to happen. What happens to contain stuff under the surface of, the, uh, of England? I, th I think, I think, as Jonathan was saying, that's one of your hazards, one of your criteria to try and avoid those. Can we move on to? We we'll talk after. <coughs> Good question. Chat the black shirt down there, and we'll go back after there after that one. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation, and and um, and I th I think a, a, a tremendous engineering challenge to to think in the timescales you're talking about. I was really um, interested by one aspect of an early slide where you were saying. That where you situate uh, kind of the above surface and below surface, th there's actually quite a lot of flexibility that the facility right. may not be. And I'm just wondering, because you also alluded to the fact that it could be offshore, yep. that, that you could, and I'm just wondering how, like, you know, we're seeing, for example, London Array and, you know, a lot of renewable energy has been pushed offshore because people don't want it in their backyard. How realistic, because there is no um, community necessarily that would speak on behalf of an offshore ah, facility. So all of the offshore scenarios, actually we, we don't call it the offshore, okay. funny enough we call it the inshore, because the inshore zone is <clears throat> up to 20 kilometres from the coast. It's Crown Estate land and therefore the land ownership is straightforward. So all of the scenarios we plan for for, for inshore disposal okay. off the coast uh, have surface facilities onshore on the coast and then a drift extending out uh, to the GDF. So an example of where that's happening today, you may have heard of Bulby Mine uh, up in the northeast of England. So Sirius Mine has been in the newspapers a lot. So it's a, a potash mine that's being developed up in the northeast for polyhalite. <coughs> Most of the resource there is up to 13 kilometers out into the North Sea. The surface facilities are on the coast in Cleveland. So it, you'd speak to a mining engineer or a tunneling, en tunneling engineer, any of the sorts of people working on the Thames Tideway project, and it's Pretty straightforward for them. It's, it's interesting, though, how many communities are really attractive when you talk about putting it in the offshore zone, the inshore zone, as if we're putting it out of harm's way. The reason we're doing it is because that's the better geology is there. Sorry. Okay. Question over there, the gentleman in the blue shirt, and we'll come down to the front lady in the black and white striped towel. Considering the uh, enormous investment there must be in, the, in this project, um, are, you, are we uh, sure that it's just going to be confined to the waste we produce, or is the intention to import waste from other sources? Ah, that's an easy one to answer. Uh, so, like all nuclear countries, we are members of the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, and they forbid uh, export uh, of radioactive waste. Now, a lot of people say to me, Hold on, that's not right. We import Japanese waste, which is true. We, Im we, import, we have until recently imported Japanese spent fuel, which is reprocessed at Thorpe. What people didn't realize is that there's a boat going in the other direction, exporting back to Japan uh, a radiologically equivalent amount, so a larger volume of lower grade waste. So no, we won't be taking other countries' waste, and we no longer import. I'm not saying that we've cut imports of foreign waste to zero, but the Thorpe reprocessing plant has now closed and is in decommissioning mode, and uh, it's against IEA rules to, to, to export. The reason being, as you could imagine a scenario in which we went to uh, a developing country, I don't know, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and said, uh, can we invest 20 million pounds in your road and rail system, and by the way, can you dot, dot, dot. So it'll be, it'll be UK waste. Uh, I hope you're right, but uh, I don't have... There's one fascinating exception, and that is that there is an idea for a global repository in South Australia, but I think it's almost dead because of the First Nation issue. We'll see. Thank you. I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, curious about whether or not uh, there was uh, examples of all of the types of rock that you were looking at. Uh, to evaluate, i.e. salt as well as the uh, low permeability uh, clays and uh, granites within the UK to assess all of the variability in the rock types for the repository. Yeah, so we've, we've got two main uh, sort of geological ages of rock that contain salt, the Permian and the Triassic. Uh, so there's plenty of facilities around the UK that mine salt not just sodium chloride, but potassium chloride, and also this weird mineral polyhalite. 
So in other words, not just for road grit, but also for potash fertilizer. So yes, plenty of salt. And we just commissioned a study, just completed a study with the British Geological Survey, understanding the distribution and the thicknesses of onshore UK salt. We've got about, uh, about eight different clays, Jurassic and younger clays, that would potentially lend themselves to a geological disposal facility. And then high-strength rock, and I always laugh at high-strength rock because a salt is a salt and a clay is a clay. High-strength rock, if I was to get out in the front of the lecture theatre here, sorry, uh, examples of high-strength rock, there'd be about 100 different types. There'd be metasediments, there'd be slates and phyllites, there'd be different sorts of granites, there'd be basalts. Remember, the definition of high-strength rock is just rock in which fluids flow via fractures. And we've got plenty of high-strength rock, even though our process excludes Scotland. We've got plenty. Yeah, there's no lack of geology to, or rather suitable geology to play with. It comes down to okay. communities. <laughs> uh, question down the front here. I, I just wondered what the difference um, in the cost of a number of, uh, of a facility like that in uh, salt on the one hand, or, or clay, and uh, a crystalline rock. Hmm. <coughs> whether whatever um, whatever is <coughs> would be would be uh, the funds would be made available. I mean, or or, or is that any kind of driver, or is there not much difference? It's interesting, you know, when we uh, talk to Treasury and give them an idea of the uh, you know a, a broad range of uh, cost predictions for this project over a hundred year plus. Period. They just go, yeah, that looks that looks fine. And, you know, so it's, it's an astronomic figure. You can be sure that when it comes to writing business cases for individual tranches of the project, there will be a laser focus on, well, if this clay is cheaper, why are you even looking at this granite. salt, that kind, or that granite, or whatever? So that's that's an answer to part of your question, Rod. The other part is. There's a number of different factors that feed into costs. So one is uh, how expensive it is to excavate in high-strength rock versus clay, for example. And the whole tunneling industry is changing so rapidly. I mean, uh, drill and blast is, is practically part of history now. It's tunnel boring machines. There's this 70-meter-long continuous miner at the facility in Sweden that looks like something out of Batman. It's just extraordinary. And so... Actually, our understanding of tunneling costs is changing dramatically. Another thing that you, or two other bits to it before I finish the question, the cost of keeping the facility open whilst you're down there, very low for high strength rock because it's so strong. You saw the picture from Sweden, it's unlined, whereas you saw the picture from France, it's got those panels around it, much more expensive. And then the third bit, which you might not think of, is the thermal properties of the different geologies determine the spacing for the spent fuel. Now, <clears throat> the reason why the Swedes went for Forschmark over Oskarsham, they're both granites, Sweden's all granite except for the southern part, is that the Forschmark site, the thermal properties of that granite uh, necessitated a six meter spacing, Oskarsham nine meters. So, you know, a change in thermal conductivity, suddenly imagine the cost impact that has because you mean a much larger footprint. So it's not just a, a simple case of how expensive it is to tunnel into it. It's keeping it open, keeping it safe, and the thermal properties in particular. OK, one last question. Gentleman down there. You can just wait for the microphone. Thanks. Just a quick one is, why are you excluding Scotland? <laughs> why are we still in Scotland, did you say? Why are we excluding? Oh, exclude, yeah. <laughs> because it's a, it's a devolved process. So you, you probably noticed I was careful to say that before... Christmas, the English government published the working, its working with communities policy. And then about three weeks ago, the Welsh government published theirs. We won't see one from Scotland because they're one of the few countries who are dealing with this challenge who have opted for a different solution. In fact, the only country that I can think of. And their solution is not deep geological disposal, but it's what's called near surface, near source. Now, their inventory is much smaller than ours because most of the dune ray material will come south to the uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland facility. Um, uh, the defence material near Glasgow will come south. So I can't remember exactly what their inventory comprises, but they do have an inventory, and at the moment their solution is near surface, near source. 
So it's, it's a devolved process, and it's up to each government to make its decision. And they have an equivalent to, to RWM doing? No, they don't. Uh, RWM does work on a contract basis for them. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Great. Well, I just be honest, I think we've all learned a lot this evening. Uh, and uh, some of it is sort of, you know, quite reassuring and, and <coughs> this all makes sense. And some of it is there's some you know, very good questions, very typical of the questions you must get in every community yeah. you're going to go and talk to. So you'll hear this many Thank times. Thank you very much. But, uh, yeah. Lovely questions. Good, good training. <laughs>